Hello and welcome to the final part of the Crash Course Guide for Foundation Block for first year. Today we're going to be taking a look at the immune response and it's just going to be the immune response in this video because it is a heck of a topic to understand. So let's start by having a look at a diagrammatic representation of the immune response. What we see here are two responses, the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. Now this is the infection that the organism has been infected with and as you can see as the duration of infection goes on our in our response changes from being innate to adaptive and what this means we'll discuss a little bit more later on but it's really important to understand these two aspects of the immune response. It's also important to understand the cells that are involved within the immune response but also that they all come from one stem cell. Now a stem cell can either be a lymphoid stem cell or a myeloid progenitor cell and the cells that these lead to are all of the cells that are involved within the immune response as well as some other things on the side, such as the complement system, which we'll have a look at in a moment. So, the immune system is essential for our survival. It protects us from all those viruses and bacteria and foreign substances that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. It also detects and responds to abnormal cells and molecules that periodic de periodically develop in our body, so that diseases such as cancer do not occur. Now, an essential aspect of the immune response is the ability to recognise almost limitless numbers of foreign cells and non-self substances. So, in other words, anything that's not a cell of our own body, that's not native to our body, it can distinguish itself from non-self. The immune system consists of the central and peripheral lymphoid tissues. And the individual components of the substance that the immune system recognises as foreign are called antigens. So, anything that we find in our system that isn't normal, that isn't self, it's foreign, we call them antigens. And the interaction of the collective and coordinated components of the immune system and the antigens of a foreign agent is called the immune response all over. So, we have innate and adaptive. Now, the innate immune response is our first line of defence. It's the first thing that takes action, it's fast, and it responds in minutes to hours to a foreign invader. And it's constantly switched on. It's constantly circulating in the body and looking for new, foreign, non-self pathogens. The problem is, it doesn't distinguish one type of pathogen from another. But the upside is that it's fast. It responds in minutes to hours, and that's really important as our first line of defence. It includes things like skin, mucous membranes, our inflammatory response, phagocytic leukocytes, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and the complement system. We'll have a little bit more of a look at these now. So we have our sentinel cells, in other words our soldiers. They're resident in the tissues and they recognise invading pathogens and they alert the immune system. So things like mast cells, dendritic cells and macrophages. We also have phagocytes, so these are our killers really, such as neutrophils, macrophages and dendritic cells. These are resident in the tissue or sometimes recruited from the blood and these engulf and kill invading pathogens. And they also alert the adaptive immune response if they can't cope with it themselves. We also have innate lymphoid cells, such as natural killer cells and innate lymphoid cells. These are also resident in the tissues and kill infected or transformed cells. So cells, for example, that have changed within the body. So self cells that are now non-self because they've changed. And they also produce cytokines. So the adaptive immune response is a little different. It's our second line of defense and it requires priming by antigens. It's a slow response. It takes over one to two weeks to get going, but it's much more potent. It's much more strong in dealing with the insult. And memory cells from the adaptive system can remember specific pathogens for re-exposure in the future, which is why we rarely suffer from certain diseases more than once, for example, chickenpox. So we become more effective with repeated exposures. And we have two aspects. We have humoral immunity and cellular immunity. So our humoral immunity is concerned with B cells and antibodies. And we'll talk about these a little bit more in a moment. And our cellular immunity is all to do with cytotoxic, in other words, killer, and helper T cells. So our adaptive defense is made up of three components as well. So our CD4 T cells, and what we mean by CD4 is just helper T cells. They help. They're developed in the thymus and they help B cells to produce antibodies and also promote the work that macrophages are doing by killing the foreign insult. They also regulate T cells, suppress the activity of other immune cells. Now we have CD8 T cells and these are cytotoxic or killer T cells. These also develop in the thymus but they kill cells that are infected with intracellular pathogens such as a virus. 
and lastly we have B cells. These are really important and they develop in the bone marrow and produce antibodies. So antibodies bind and neutralize pathogens and enhance their uptake by phagocytes and activate the complement system. Hopefully we'll understand this a little bit more as we go through it. We also have soluble mediators. So this is just introducing you to all the components of the immune response first. So soluble mediators facilitate antigen uptake by antigen presenting cells. And they can promote or inhibit the immune response. And it's made up of cytokines and the complement system. And there are several pathways involved in the complement system, but don't get bogged down with it for now. So soluble mediators. Complement system. These bind to pathogens, so bind to the bodies that are infecting our bodies and their products, and they facilitate their uptake by phagocytes. And remember, phagocytes are those cells that kill pathogens in the innate system. Cytokines. These are small soluble proteins produced by cells of the immune system, and they act on cell surface receptors of other immune cells, and they may activate or inhibit an immune response. And lastly, we have antibodies. These bind and neutralize pathogens and facilitate the uptake of phagocytes, uh, pathogens by phagocytes. Again, those killing cells. So think of the immune response step by step. We have innate followed by adaptive. So let's take a look at our innate response first. Step one, there's a breach of our first barrier of defense, such as our skin. For example, we could have a cut and bacteria crosses the epidermis, our skin, and establishes an infection in the underlying tissue. Now, in large numbers, the bacteria start to damage the body by changing the environment around them. So this is the bacteria on the epidermis, and here it is coming into the dermis. Step two, PAMPs. These are pathogen-associated molecular patterns. These are common on the surface of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And we don't have PAMPs on our normal host self cells. So therefore, they're really recognisable as being foreign pathogens. They also have damage-associated molecular patterns are released from dying host cells or damaged connective tissue, and they might release these when they're invaded by a pathogen. Sentinel cells detect these PAMPs and DAMPs by the pattern recognition receptors that they have on them. So remember, sentinel cells are those guard cells that are always travelling around looking for PAMPs and DAMPs. And the sentinel cells that are first activated are macrophages followed by neutrophils. So macrophages are the first to act to defend the body, and macrophages are large cells and can usually destroy an attack on the immune system by themselves. And actually, we often don't even know that this attack has happened because the macrophages deal with it so quickly and so effectively, and they break the pathogen down. Macrophages also can cause a bit of inflammation by causing blood vessels to leak water into the tissue to make it easier to kill the pathogens. And this we notice maybe is a bit of redness or swelling. So here we have a macrophage coming along, ingesting the pathogen and lysing it, in other words, killing it. So this is inflammation that we get. So we often notice this as red, warm, for example, on the skin. And sentinel cells release vasoactive molecules, so cytokines and chemokines. And these lead to things like vasodilation, uh, recruitment of other immune cells, and production of acute phase proteins. So remember, we, we see this as heat, redness and swelling and pain. So these really are good things in our body because they're showing that we're responding to infection. Step three, when the macrophages have been fighting for a long time and are tired, they call in neutrophils from the blood. And neutrophils are very aggressive immune cells that fight aggressively and kill healthy cells in the process. So this is maybe where we start to feel a bit run down by our infection. And neutrophils also create nets. And these are traps for the bacteria. So neutrophils are programmed to undergo apoptosis after five days to prevent causing too much damage because they're destroying our normal cells as well. So here comes the neutrophil, also carrying out phagocytic behaviour. And if the neutrophil response is still not enough, the dendritic cell comes along and responds to mediators released from macrophages and neutrophils. It takes part of, part of the antigen on its cell surface and goes to the nearest lymph nodes. But this takes about a day. And this marks the start of the adaptive immune response. So here goes your dendritic cell to the nearest lymph node from the site of infection. So that's pretty much a summary of the innate response. So now let's take a look at the adaptive response, this more lethal, fast-acting response. So step one, the dendritic cell primes immature helper and killer T cells that are waiting in the lymph nodes. For this, it's crucial to understand about T cell development. So just to be a little bit aware, T cells are created, they undergo a rigorous selection and development process, and only a quarter of T cells that are produced survive. And the surviving cells are equipped with a specific surface ability. 
So, in the lymph node, the dendritic cells prime these immature helper and killer T cells. And the dendritic cell is searching for a T cell that is complementary to the antigen that it has on its surface. In other words, it's complementary to the pathogen that's invading. When it finds one that's a match, this causes a chain reaction and mass production of this complementary helper T cell. So it's looking for it, it finds it, and it massively replicates it. Step two, there's a mass production of this helper T cell that's complementary, and some become memory T cells, which will stay in the lymph node and improve the body's response in the future, and some will travel to site of infection to help fight the infection. And there they go to the site of infection, and some remain as antibodies for the future in case we're re-exposed. So the B cells duplicate rapidly and produce thousands of antibodies, and the T helper cell continues to stimulate the B cell to prevent it getting tired because it's working so hard. So antibodies are tiny proteins that bind to the surface of the pathogen. And there are five different types of antibodies, and we remember these via the gained analogy, so Ig and then gained. The helper T cells detect which type of antibody is needed the most. And there we go, so the T helper cell is inspiring by the B cell to continue and produce antibodies. So by the time this has all happened, the pathogens multiplied and started to harm the body. We're pretty unwell at this point. Helper T cells try to support macrophages and neutrophils, but it's not enough. And we actually really need these antibodies now and cytotoxic T cells. So our cytotoxic T cells are our biggest killer, and they kill any viral pathogens. And antibodies can either kill pathogens, destable them, or stun them to make them easier to kill. And this is a process called opsonization. And here we see the antibodies at work priming these pathogens, opsonizing them and stunning them so it's easier for the T cells to kill them. And the immune response has won and the infection therefore is wiped out by this attack. And but, but many host cells have already died and these are quickly replenished, but most immune cells will undergo apoptosis now they're no longer needed. Some will remain as memory B cells and memory T cells for the future. This allows you to understand the different cells involved. So we've just talked about lots of different cells in the immune system. I'm not going to go through them individually, but it's worth going through them and understanding what each cell does and what its role is within the immune response. As you can see, there are lots of cells involved within the immune system. Some of these are part of the innate response. Some of them are part of the adaptive response. But either way, it's important to be aware of what they all do. A little side note about MHC, so you can have class 1 MHC and class 2 MHC, and the most important thing to be aware is that class 1 is recognised by cytotoxic T cells and expressed on all nucleated cells, and class 2 MHC is expressed only on antigen-presenting cells and recognised by T helper cells. Antibodies are also something that's important to be aware of, and again, it's just a case of road learning. Have a look at them. Remember, we talked about gamed as being the analogy to remember, but the majority of antibodies are 75% IgG. Be aware of what each one does, and particularly be aware of the one that doesn't pass, um, so it does pass from mother to fetus um, in pregnancy. And that's IgG, the only one that crosses the placenta. This is what an antibody looks like in diagrammatic view. Also be aware of the complement system and how that helps the immune response. Don't learn this in great detail, but be aware that there are three pathways. So classical, alternative, and lectin pathways. Classical is the most common, and it acts via an antibody. Alternative acts via direct contact with a pathogen, and lectin acts via carbohydrate binding mediators. There's an absolutely crazy pathway that you can learn, but be aware of the main ones and how they happen, all leading to a membrane attack complex. That's the end goal for all of that. So phagocytes, the two phagocytes of the innate immune system, macrophages and neutrophils, they're really easy to compare characteristics and therefore make great exam questions. Put it all together and this is what you get. This is a great diagram just to summarise the whole innate and adaptive immune response. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we'll just quickly review some of the questions that we went over at the start of all of these videos. Again, pause it to give yourself time to answer these questions. So the four bases in RNA, hopefully now you know they're A, U, C and G. Which of the following is true for a neutrophil? Hopefully after this video you know that they release toxins that kill or inhibit bacteria. And two harder MCQs for you now. When does independent assortment occur? This is a really tricky question. Remember meiosis has two sets of division. It occurs in metaphase 1. And the second harder MCQ, the G protein coupled receptor crosses the membrane how many times? And the answer here is 7 if you think back to the diagram that we saw earlier in the videos. 
And thank you very much for watching. That is the end of this series. If you do have any questions or feedback, please do let me know. Thank you.